What I want to do is change gears now a little bit and talk about the non-reversible situation. What happens in a real cell, not, not, a, not one that's perfectly reversible? So let's let reality set in. And that gives, brings us to the subject of a polarization curve. And polarization curve is basically a relationship between the voltage of a cell, the cell voltage, and the amount of current that we pass through it. Um, so on this axis, I'm going to put voltage. This axis is current density. Uh, current is often characterized in terms of what's called the current density. This is the uh, amps that we're passing through the cell on an area normalized basis. So usually people will you know, measure different size cells, but you, you would have to specify the cell size in order for that to be meaningful. So a lot of times authors will take the current divided by the area of the cell, and that gives us what's called the current density, usually symbolized with a lowercase i instead of a capital I. And then we think about what the cell is doing. So at zero, zero current, that's where we expect to see the equilibrium voltage. So this point right here, this is V equilibrium. So in, you know, in principle, if, if, if our fuel cell had infinite performance, transport is easy and the kinetics or the reaction is infinitely fast, meaning for any rate, we have zero driving force. So no matter what current we passed, we would get the same cell voltage and that would be wonderful, but that's not actually what happens <laughs> because uh, reality sets in. So what actually happens is that as you pass more current, more and more driving force is needed to cause the anode reaction to proceed, the cathode reaction to proceed. We have to push ions across the membrane. There might be mass transfer effects. We're going to talk about all of these different contributions to cell loss, but their net effect that we actually see and measure is that the cell voltage drops below the equilibrium voltage as we pass more current. And that looks something like this. So it drops down. Usually it drops down more quickly at first and then drops down more gradually as you proceed. And then at some point it may plummet downward very quickly or at different rates, depending on the situation. And we can hit something called the limiting current. Limiting current is the place where um, you can't pass any more current, no matter how fat, no matter how much driving force you put on the cell, you can drive the voltage all the way to zero and uh, you still only get a certain amount of current. Um, so this is a zero current maximum voltage condition. That's what we call the reversible cell potential. And then at the maximum current zero voltage condition, that's, that's what we call limiting current. You can't pass any current faster than that. Uh, and then typically what we'll do is we'll operate the cell somewhere in between those two limits at a place that is optimized for efficiency or power density or whatever other things we're trying to engineer this system to do. Um, so, you know, like here, we said this was, you know, 1.03 volts in our example. Maybe we would operate somewhere around 0.7 volts and get a finite current density that we can measure. Um, and an SOFC, this would be typically around some fraction of an amp per square centimeter. Something like this. Depends on temperature, depends on fuel flow conditions and all that stuff. And we're gonna go come back to this and talk a lot more detail about this relationships. Um, I will point out also incidentally that if we think about what happens in the backward direction, like over here, We have another relationship at negative currents. Negative current means we're doing electrolysis. So this would be like if we were taking water and splitting it into hydrogen and oxygen, we would need voltages higher than the reversible cell potential. So this is the electrolysis region up here. For people who do electrolysis, they would normally define the current as positive for electrolysis. 
fuel cell engineers flip, flip it around and they talk about the current being positive for a fuel cell and it's negative if you're doing electrolysis. So a related thing we can plot is power. So this is often, often, often plotted as power density. Power density, this is in watts per square centimeter. This is just taking V cell times the current density. And plotting that as a function of current density. I think you can guess what this might kind of look like. If we are at zero, if we look at the this curve that we drew above it, at zero current, we have the maximum voltage. But current times voltage when the current is zero is zero. So we're, we have maximum energy per electron, but we're not passing an electron, any electrons. So we don't get any power out of a fuel cell that is operating at zero current. Uh, on the other hand, if we go to the limiting current, we also get zero because there we're, we're passing a current, but we don't have any voltage. So voltage times current is zero there as well. And then in between, we're going to see some type of positive maximum. It looks like whatever it's going to look like. I'm just drawing it as a kind of a inverted circle, but it, in general, it'll be some function that will be asymmetric and you'll, we expect a maximum power somewhere. So this is the point of maximum power density. So if you were trying to minimize capital cost, for example, you want to have produce a certain amount of power for the minimum amount of cell area, then you would operate near the power maximum. On the other hand, that might put you out pretty far on the polarization curve where you're not very efficient. So you're running at relatively low cell voltages, which means that we're not getting um, as much power per unit fuel. Whereas if we operate close to zero current, we need more cell area to get produce the same amount of power, but the power we produce is more efficient. So we use less fuel. So that's kind of a trade-off you can sort of see right away on a polarization curve like this.